Hello, welcome to uh, my poster. And this is a poster is basically on the electron transport under the ultra fast laser pulse. So let me show you here. So I'm going to move it slightly to the right and I hope I've been able to do it. Yeah. So ultra fast laser pulse and implication for the spin transport. This work was done mainly by uh, students, Ravi Vidos and my postdoc, Yung Xue, and uh, another student, Nicholas Alberton. My name is Gopin Zhan. And we are from Indiana State University and Milwaukee Area Te Technical College. So in this particular presentation, and I'm gonna talk about uh, our a recent study uh, based on the uh, uh, simple simulations. Let me show you a little motivation of this particular study. Our motivation is on the fact that what happens if your laser hit on the sample and we know that the electron is moved inside the sample. However, theoretically, there is a problem. The problem is that electric field, and I'm going to use annotation here. So electric field only move along the, uh, this, uh, the y axis. So that's what we have, but the a magnetic field along the the x axis, so like that. So then there is a problem with this particular feature. So in other words, my vertical axis is the electro field. That's the let's suppose this is the y axis, and this is the x axis is the magnetic field. So electron only experience a force mainly along the are the vertical axis or the y axis. How it is possible the electron can travel along the z axis, which is here? And this is the question we want to answer. Let me show you what experimental says. So the bottom here is experimental uh, results. So I'm going to slightly move down. So you can see experimentally, the palm pulse is hit on the sample, which is iron itself. Hit on sample, and then after a while, these electrons move across the sample and go through into the, the gold sample now. And when you probe it, you probe the backside of the sample. If, if the spin is not polarized, it, so then there is no spin polarization involved. So there will be zero signal come out from this. However, experimentally, as you can see here, it does show the signals. Here's the signal. So that's why this is a little bit surprising how it is possible the signal will come out like this. So that is the question uh, we want to answer them, how this actually go through it. Now, in order to understand this, we need to develop a theory. The theory is based on called a Hertz vector. Hertz vector have two components, essentially. It's just synthesize the vector potential such a way that satisfies Hamilton's equation then from that on, we plug that equation into the Maxwell equation. Eventually, we can find E and B. And these are really complicated integrals over that. The only way that we can do the integrating them out is we use the um, so-called paraxial approximation. Essentially, it's allow each one of the kx, ky, kz independent change. That's called a paraxial approximation. So that way we can include our laser pulse shape, special shape. So let me highlight this. This is special shape laser pulse. And such way that if you want a Gaussian pulse, you plug it in a Gaussian pulse here. The only case you can integrate it uh, analytically is the Gaussian pulse. Not other pulse can be can done like this. So now let me show you a little further on this part. In other words, how the theoretical expression look like. So this is the uh, thing that I'm going to show you now. Theoretically, we have two essential analytical equations under the paraxial approximation, and we solve the Newtonian equation of motion for the electron. All these elect results were compared with the uh, Rosdalski's uh, nature communication data. So they found that the depths that electron can go through the sample is around two nanometer or 20 angstroms. So this is the our target value. And here gamma that I'm gonna highlight here is used for, did you see here the gamma? So this gamma is essential damping. If I make this gamma uh, smaller, 
then you can see total value is going to be larger. So you have larger, large damping. You can scale this up or down depending on your need. Of course, you have to match the experimental data though. So this is the quite, quite uh, important uh, because if you do not match the experimental data, and that won't be able to uh, uh, do the calculation. So this is, this is essentially quite useful. Why didn't I realize the Zoom has these features? Uh, it goes away, wonderful. Anyway, let me continue. So now, what I want to show you is, is this. Let me move down. This is the, our uh, theoretical results. First figure that I showed you is the uh, our laser pulse. Uh, the P part is the VX, the velocity along the X direction, and uh, velocity along the Y direction. Remember, the vertical axis is the Y uh, X direction. I mislabeled it probably above. But anyway, this is the VX and uh, X. We see that the displacement on the X direction along the laser field direction is very small. However, along the Z axis or the propagation direction is large. Depending on the damping parameter, it can be reached to 20 nanom uh, to uh, 2 nanometers, not 20 nan 2 nanometers in this case. So essentially, we agree with experimental data very, very well. We'll also investigate the dependence on the laser fluorence, and you can see the quadratic dependence also depend on the laser uh, photon energy. If we, have, if we have a smaller photon energy, we found that actually it uh, the the displacement will be larger. So you see here, it's not two nanometers, it's actually 15 nanometers, way, way large. So this is the quite important for terahertz experiment data. And we know that from terahertz experiment data, we can uh, investigate a lot of these kind of different processes. We also investigate spin dynamics simulated by this particular equation. And you can see we can also simulate spin increase, spin decrease, or spin reversal. All these three processes are worked very, very well. And finally, let me conclude uh, my sh short presentation. As you can see, the presentation requires two different fields. One is electric field, one the magnetic field. If you simply have one field, it won't work. It won't propagate into that along the z-axis. And so because the magnetic field, whenever present a magnetic field, you need a, a vector potential, which is depend on the space. So that's quite an important requirement. Because of this, that's why all the prior theories which use the vector potential, which is spatially independent, uh, it's not uh, possible to describe the uh, spin uh, electron transport. So that's it. That's our presentation. And I hope you enjoy it. And if you have any questions, please do let me know. And again, my uh, name is Guo Ping Zhan, and we are from Indiana State University. And uh, if I see you, uh, in the meeting and please say hello to me and I want to thank you so much.